Welcome back, everybody, to a new episode of Podcast on the Brink. Pleased to be joined this week by an IU grad and one of the authors of one of my favorite college basketball sites. These guys do tremendous work. The three-man weave, Matt Cox. You're here on Podcast on the Brink, first time ever. It, it, I, I'm, I'm kind of uh, embarrassed it took me this long to ask you on the show, but here you are. It's an honor. It's a privilege. Thank you for having me. Uh, I was just saying off air or I was DMing you. I have the podcast on the brink and the assembly call both on my daily feed. So try and stay as plugged into the local IU pulse as I can. Um, but when your pseudo job is to cover 358 teams, I'm, I'm sure I miss a few episodes every now and then. So I apologize for those, for those blind spots, but yeah, man, uh, happy to be here. Let's talk Hoosier big 10 and broader hoops. But we were talking a little bit before uh, I hit record just on your background, you, you went to IU, you were there for, um, the, the shirts that said we're back. I think that's what I think that's what the theme was of those years. You you started at the beginning of Crean uh and kind of were there through I think the season they lost to Syracuse. Does that sound right? What what uh Yes. Um, oh yes. What yeah. was that like just being at IU at that time? Well yeah, I mean I think the from two thousand eight to two thousand thirteen, uh a lot of my uh three two program brethren who who messaged me when they saw I was coming on your your podcast uh gave me a, sh- a shout out before I, before we did this. I think that span of IU fandom was really like from the lowest of lows to not quite the highest of highs, but the pinnacle in terms of regular season performance. Um, obviously Tom Crane's inability to solve a zone was, was annoying and that will forever tarnish every IU fans brains forever. But that was a, yeah, it was a wild time. Um, like I said, we were given standing ovations to Tom Pritchard and Kyle Tabor year one. And then by the end we have guys doing somersaults, 360 alley oop dunks and depot and Zeller and front page covers and the whole nine yards and uh good times. Feels like just yesterday, but it's sadly a, a decade now in the rear view mirror. So you look at college basketball not just from a big ten perspective, you're looking at pretty much the whole nation with with it with everything you guys do over at Three Man Weave. So one of the reasons I wanted to have you on, like this Mike Woodson hire, well, you know, in the off season. I think there was mixed reviews from the national media because we've kind of seen this this play before where you hire somebody from the NBA and, and it come and they come in and it, it, you know it's worked out in the case of Jawan Howard and a couple of other guys but a lot of times it doesn't work out. Why do you feel uh, first of all what was your reaction to Indiana going out and getting Woodson and second what do you see maybe in this situation that lends itself to success uh more than say you know chris mullen at st john's or countless other examples of guys who are former players coming back to college i think my first reaction was a a little bit um not skepticism but i I have to you know three years ago you're right the the stigma of nba defectors who go to college sort of walk into a head coaching job with little experience, think they're just going to recruit all the best players, throw them out there, it's going to work out. You know, It wasn't a recipe for success. But then we've seen more recent precedents, no stronger case than Juwan Howard. Um, and then you know, once you kind of rewire your brain to think about, okay, yeah, there's presence of success here. And then you, as the summer went on, you saw who he added to his staff, um, just all the off-season you know, favorable, optimistic type of reporting with the, the players buying in, the recruits that he got. It it kind of slowly, you know, you know, incrementally grew in my mind. And, and now I'm in a point where I'm like, I'm pretty all in. <laughs> and I feel like I'm one of the IU um, you know, diehard sheep who was probably, you know, thrilled to get Kareen out of there for Archie and hopes to return to more blue collar, defensive first mind to basketball. And I'm sure many of those folks are now t- talking out of the other side of the mouth with the I'm so sick of that type of basketball. We're getting some fun NBA modern. So I, I'm trying to make sure I'm not being hypocritical in how I feel now and how I felt with the cream to Archie transition. But I, I've fully bought into Woodson, the staff and, and what his vision is. Um, and I'm going to drink the Kool-Aid, which is something I try so hard not to do. But but here I am. But why going back to Archie for a second? You know, we have this is something I've thought about a lot for a long time, even before he was let go, because, you know, I had a, like even if they kept him for another year, he was basically at that point a lame duck. Like he, he was never, right, it was right. never going to work after your booed at the big 10 tournament, losing to Rutgers for the third time in the same season. There's really no coming back from that. So 
you know, I was one of the ones when, when they hired Archie, I was like, wow, this is, this is a good hire. I mean, this is on that individual and in that individual spring. I mean, Chris Holtman, Brad Underwood and, and Archie were all hired. And, you know, I thought in the kind of, in the back of my mind, this, this might be the best hire of those three. It was actually the worst of those three. What did you see over those four years that I, I guess maybe surprised you if, if you were kind of like me in, in that boat when he was coming in, that, that he was actually going to do a pretty good job? I'll toot my horn slightly here. I to I'll quote a, a take that um, I thought was very perceptive when Archie was hired. Uh, Jordan Majeski, who I'm sure many folks are listening, know his name, uh, mid-major guru, but very plugged in with IU basketball locally there. I think he dubbed it a double of a hire, right? Relative to some of the names that were thrown out, the expectations that were being tossed around, floated to the fan base, to the alumni about who they were going to target. So to get Archie, I think was, I think that was an apt comparison. It was probably like, it felt like a solid hire. And, you know, at the end of the tenure, I don't know if I'm, if I'm ready to declare his, his, his service a complete flaming disaster. Um, obviously, it had some tough circumstances. You know, twenty twenty what was a tough beat, and then last year, you know, completely falling off the map there down the stretch. Um, not saying there's no blood in his hands, but you know, I, I don't like in hindsight view his view what he's done as a complete failure. I just think it speaks to this is the landscape of college basketball. This is how good the Big Ten is. This is how good other programs, how quickly other programs are, are rising up the ranks. And when you have a long dormant period of, you know, mediocre to slightly above mediocre products on the floor, that that's sort of like the mean expectation, you know, litmus test for, for where you're going to come in. So I thought Archie, honestly, relative to that, it, it didn't do a terrible job. The, the issue is that I think myself included and Indiana fans think that there's a higher bar out there. And so how do you get, how do you reach that? And I think a guy like Woodson with all that he offers and you know where the puck is going in, in basketball. Woodson is is that guy, I think, right? So we'll we'll find out in probably two three years, and perhaps he expedites that that process this season. But that's why I like the Woodson over Archie higher. I think it at least gives him more of an upside. Where Archie's floor was always pretty high, but his ceiling was low. You know, like I don't think there's a wide range of outcomes with Archie. There's a little more of an upside, which gives some more optimism to the Woodson era. But what do you like in particular about Woodson? Is it just the infrastructure that he's got around? I mean, having Dane Fife, Kenya Hunter, you see a Roseman. I mean, that's we talked about Archie's staff when he came in being a really good staff. To me, this is a lot better. Uh, yes, of a, of a well-rounded coaching staff. He, they've already kind of proved it in recruiting. Although to Archie's credit, he did start out pretty well getting some guys that first summer. Um, but to me, that gives it a, a better chance to maybe go a uh, higher ceiling long-term, but, but beyond that, what do you like maybe about the Woodson hire that uh, better than, than what you saw with Archie and, and what gives you optimism that this time is going to be different? I think the staff is huge. That's one of the things I've grown to appreciate the last probably three, four seasons where I've been covering college basketball as a quote unquote, full-time job. Um, it, the importance of having a great staff like matters. And I think Juwan Howard with Phil Martelli and his staff next to him on the sidelines, that's exhibit A. And you're seeing a lot of these um, coaches, even like Texas with Chris Beard, he's just assembling a, a murderer's row of, just, of established good head coaches who now want to be an assistant deputy guy at the elite of the elite. And when you have specialists and have such a, you know, a guy who's a defensive coordinator, a guy who's, you know, plugged into the analytics. I mean, that stuff has incremental value and that adds up. And I think that's going to be a big boost for Woodson. Secondly, I, I feel like a sucker saying this because I don't know how many blue ribbon off season preview quotes, pressers, where everyone wants to play fast and play this fun, inventive style of NBA influence basketball, yada, yada, yada. I mean, the coach speak is through the roof at this point, but um, there's something about Woodson's uh, vision with it that I think makes a lot of sense. Uh, the, the fact that he's going to have a balanced staff that won't be completely one-sided to the offensive end. And on top of that, he's made such strong recruiting strides in his first um, you know, a few months at the helm. A add all that up, and I, I think we'll end up talking about Woodson 2024 um, as, a, you know, as an upgrade to Archie and you know, arguably to, to Mr. Crean as well, given what he sort of meddled through the last few years. Yeah. That's that's interesting because Crean, for all of his faults, when you kind of look at the whole body of work, you know, whatever you want to throw out at the beginning, if you want to throw out the first two years, first three years, he still did go to three su su sweet 16s, one, two outright Big Ten titles. That's, I think, 
IU fans, if Mike Woodson in the first three or four, five years wins two outright Big Ten titles, they're well, going to be, be a, pretty, pretty be happy a podium. with that. Yeah, there'll right. be a whole, like, he'll be, he'll be a, a god. Yeah. So this year is interesting to me because we were talking a little bit before on, on this as well. I think Three Man Weave has Indiana fifth in the Big Ten. You personally, I think, told me you had him six. I have him eighth. Um, IU fans obviously don't like that, but I'm, I've wow. kind of been, I've kind of been, um, I guess burn one too many times. You know, I voted in this pre <laughs> this this preseason official unofficial Big Ten media poll because the Big Ten won't release their own preseason media poll for whatever reason. So Brendan Quinn of the Athletic and Adam Jardy of the Columbus Dispatch they get two writers from each school and they ask us all for order of finish and I picked them eighth. Um, and I think some IU fans were were asking me, you know, why are you so low on them? And I'm like, well, what's my reason for being? you know, fifth or like fifth or six, like teams like Michigan state, Maryland Rutgers, you're picking Indiana ahead of them. If you're picking them, you know, fifth or six. So why, I guess maybe why are you a little bit higher on this team? Is it, is it Woodson? Is it, is there something you like about the roster? Is it just trace coming back for me? Trace coming back is awesome. Um, in terms of a production, because you know, you have this guy in there that's probably gonna be 20 and 10 every night, but I have questions about the guard play. I don't know how good Xavier Johnson is. I just know that the last time he played, he didn't finish the season at Pittsburgh. And, you know, you look at some of the stories that yep. were written about him late in the season. There was talk about technicals and uh, he, I know he turned the ball over a lot. Rob Finnessy, we kind of have a pretty good idea of what he is as a player. And Christian Lander last year was basically a non-factor. So to me, like, you got to have a good point guard. So that's kind of where my, uh, right. my pause comes in on Indiana. Why are you higher than, than I am on, on the Hoosiers. I mean, again, function of your eye, you mentioned the key teams where if you have them, you know, at my Kai and Jim, I think had them fifth, which is ahead of Michigan state, Maryland Rutgers. I have them sixth, just a smidge below Michigan state. Although I would argue identical. And then I had, do have IU a, a tad a, a few notches above again, not much Maryland and Rutgers there for at sixth. Um, and so part of that is a little, I'm a little bit more bearish on Maryland as a team. So that's, I think, you know, putting IU to the side there. Um, and Rutgers has some limitations as well, although I think they have a really, really high floor. You know, I think Rutgers floor is higher than Indiana because of Pykele and the defense and the physicality and how replicable that system is. Indiana obviously has the widest range of outcomes. So it's certainly a team that could finish outside of that top, you know, seven, eight, if everything flames out, but it's certainly one that has the highest ceiling amongst that Michigan State Rutgers, Maryland crew, in my opinion. Um, I, I'm with you on the point guard thing. It's, it's a little bit, and that is my only main concern, why I like the team and the makeup. Um, this team has depth, and you look at the roster up and down, and there's legitimately 12, like, you can almost go all the way down to, yeah, 13 dudes with who are worthy of playing, right? who are actually like, legitimately capable of getting on the floor, clocking 10 minutes a game and, and not being like you know a major liability. The problem that Archie had depth, it just wasn't really weaponized effectively. I think in Woodson's system, you'll play a little more up and down. You'll play more guys. And I think for a team that wants to really weaponize its strength, which is its depth, obviously you have a star at the top, but but from, you know, Tamar Bates could be one of the best super subs coming off the bench if he blossoms as everyone says he is. I still definitely believe Rob Finnessy is a good point guard when he has his head right and when he's healthy. Um, been a fan of him since day one. He's a lockdown defender. Um, and you got Galloway and Lander. I mean, these sophomores, the guys who came in last year, almost like wild cards in this team, right? You have like this experienced, established group that um, it's almost like a contingency plan to those sophomores not painting into the prospects that we thought. So you're not putting all your eggs in the sophomore basket. So it's a kind of a long-winded way of saying there's a lot of optionality. You don't need all eight guys to be good, right? I'm sure Indiana fans will, if you nitpick our preview or go through our rankings of the bench order, you'll find someone who's really high on Jordan Geronimo. You'll find a guy who's really high on Trey Galloway. My, my point is I don't really care how you rank order those. I just feel confident that enough of those kernels will pop and IU will have themselves by season's end, a good seven, eight core rotation. But if Woodson wants to extend it beyond that, I think he can with the way he's playing, right? You can't play a deep system, in my opinion, at like Syracuse or Virginia. You got to have a more up-tempo, more possessions, get guys in rhythm. And so I think that will help IU um, and was him trying to weaponize the depth that he has. 
What, so what do you you didn't mention really Xavier Johnson? What do you, what do you make of of him and his impact? Is he a so wild card I, for you, or what? what he what is a wild you, card. Yeah, I think you've brought up the concerns that no one in Indiana circles wants to. Is that that pit thing was a disaster last year? Uh, Capel lost complete control of that team. Um, I don't I don't quite get to the bottom of how much in the middle of that combustion he was. Um, but yeah, this is a guy that was talking about a fringe first round draft pick two years ago after a stellar freshman year. Him and I believe Trey McGowan's were like the this is the point the backcourt two two for the future in Pitt, and then nothing really ever became of it. And so now it's like if you could look at this from a glass half full and say this is sort of a change of scenery. He's in a better system, a better culture, more su- stronger supporting cast. Um, he should recapture that potential. But you're right, I've watched him play a lot. He is a monster talent, a powerful bulldozing guard, but his decision making and his shot selection are not always sound. Um, I mean, to me, getting back to the whole optionality thing, there's a world where fantasy is fully right. And the Xavier Johnson challenging fantasy and the competitive practice bar, which just sounds like part of the reason why they brought Johnson in actually helps fantasy leapfrog him. And fantasy may be like the primary ball handler, one of the key cogs in the backcourt and Johnson's form, just like a, a spot guy off the bench. That's probably unlikely, but Again, it comes down to like, I'm not quite sure how this rotation takes itself out, but there's so many different ways in which it could that it's, you know, it seems, you know, it seems rare that we're going to have a situation where all these guys just sort of end up on the worst end of their outcomes from an individual perspective. What about Parker Stewart and Michael Dirk and what can they bring? I mean, you obviously you've watched as much college basketball as anybody. Parker Stewart obviously came in mid season last year, didn't play given the the circumstances of everything that right. went on with with his his dad uh, tragically passing away and, and Michael Durr didn't play in the Bahamas to my knowledge hasn't really been healthy this preseason he, he was brought in you know Jerome Hunter left or, or yep. whatever, however however you want to characterize what happened with Jerome Hunter he he was gone and then Michael Durr was brought in so I'm thinking all right if Jerome you're going to let Jerome Hunter leave the person you bet you're bringing in better be able to help your team because I think you I was as high on Jerome Hunter as anybody, like long-term potential. I, I think he got caught some bad breaks. I think with a little bit more coaching and discipline, he could have been a really good player. We'll see this year at Xavier, but you know, I'm looking at that like they need that to work out too because behind Trace and, and Race, you don't necessarily, I don't think, want to be relying on Logan Duncombe as a true freshman. So w- what do you, I guess, make of Stewart and, and Durr and what they can do with this team? I think they fill very niche needs on this roster. You've sort of alluded to it, Durr. Um, he's a garbage man backup on this team. Now, South Florida, he had more alpha moments. He's a monster. I'm not sure if anyone's seen him, but he's a big, imposing dude. Uh, we saw him play up close and personal. I think they are the South Florida's in the CIT against DePaul, which is like a block away from my house here in Chicago. Um, yeah, he is a you know pretty ferocious rim protector. You know, he's a little bit of a liability sometimes on offense. He, he doesn't always, um, his skills a little bit questionable. He's sort of a black hole, but again, he's not going to be playing more than 10 minutes a game. He's just, you know, like I said, more of a fail safe, a backstop there behind race and trace. And that's fine. I think he has a solid third, fourth big, depending on how much uh, Duke develops. Stewart, again, he's, he's a shooter. He can handle, he can help break pressure. He can help initiate as a complimentary guy off the ball, but he can shoot and, um, for a team that has not done that in the last four years, to put it nicely, it's it's just certainly refreshing to at least insert him in the lineup. Now we'll see how he comes along defensively. Um, those Tennessee Martin teams couldn't guard me or you, so I'm a little bit worried about that end for him specifically. But I think he's got enough guys around him where you can kind of hide him on someone if he doesn't really pop as a lockdown defender. So if you're confident that in, you know, I don't say you're confident, but you know, you're, if you're going to pick Indiana fifth or sixth, that means you you feel pretty good about them not just being a one man crew with Trace. So who are two or three guys that you look at on a game to game basis and say, I feel pretty good about this guy being consistent on it on a night in night out basis in the Big Ten? I think that's the bearish outlook for IU. Is while I talk about the optionality, the the you know the double edged sword opposite side to that argument is well then who's going to be your consistent second and third banana on a night to night basis and I think that's a little bit concerning I I have I bought all the way into the Tamar Bates hype so I think that's a you know it's a legitimate viable option all that's a freshman so I understand it's, it could be a stretch um, you know I do think Xavier Johnson 
and or Rob Finnessy, one of those guys will be consistent. I'm not sure. I don't want it to really be a tag team tandem approach, but I think one of those guys emerges. I'm cautiously optimistic about Stewart and Cop. both. Again, I, they're both proven. They're experienced. Um, and again, their roles will be lessened and you know they'll be in a comfortable position to thrive with TJD consuming so much attention. And so that's what I think is the bullish outlook for the Johnson, Stewart, and Cop triumvirate is that while they come from not great competition, they did put up gaudy numbers there. I think they'll be more efficient, more productive with a guy like TJD taking the lead. So, you know, back to your point, that, that really is the question mark. I don't know who this team is. Who's the second leading scorer in this team? I don't know. Who's the third yeah. leading scorer? I don't know. Um, and it sort of gives you the heebie-jeebies making a bullish projection without such a uh, pe- at a very ironclad pecking order in place, but I keep going back to the optionality drum. Um, there's just too many potential dudes here that could stick. I just don't see all of them flaming out or going by the wayside. I think you make a good point on Johnson and Fantasy because they don't have to. It, one of them doesn't have to be good every game, right? Just one of one or the other, right? So if, if your poison, Johnson comes right? out, Johnson comes out doesn't play well, then you can put him on the bench for the rest of the night and play Fantasy. Maybe. You know, there's a scenario for me where Christian Lander, the light comes on, and this, I mean, right, not a five star about exactly for no right. reason. And Jordan Geronimo, another guy who I don't think a lot of people are talking about, but I think talent wise, he's p- probably one of the three or four most talented guys on the roster. So those those guys to me are high upside guy. You know, it obviously has to click, but I agree that the depth while there may not be the second, third, fourth guy who's getting you 13 or 14 a night consistently. I do think there's enough there to comfortably get this team in the tournament. Uh, I'm not, yeah. I'm not, I don't know that I'm willing to pick them, you know, top five, but I, I can see it it playing out. Uh, Big 10 perspective. Actually, just to, I, go ahead. you have a good go point ahead. there. I want to contextualize. Like, so if I have them closer to six than Big 10, I think that's rooted in. If we come away, if we get to April and we look back and say none of the underclassmen really made leaps forward, then I think your projection of eighth or ninth is probably more reasonable, where you rely more on the upperclassmen transfers. You sort of got duds with the the underclassmen, but I think that's enough at the top end to keep you in that, you know, below, you know, out of the basement of the Big Ten. But if you get a few of those those underclassmen to to really blossom in year two, that's where I think my top six, top five, fringe top four projection has to come to fruition. It's through, everything is through that skeleton hole, right? Is the, uh, it, it's through those, those underclassmen. I mean, Bates especially, right? I mean, everything I've heard about him is, he's the real deal. So we'll see how it pans out. The Big Ten perspective, is the league worse this year than it has been the last couple of years? Is it near the, like, how are you viewing the league as a whole? Um, I think it's not as top heavy as it was last year. Um, we got raked over the coals for claiming this team had no national title contenders. And we stuck to that claim most of the way through the year, even as good as the Big Ten looked. And then they had the tournament flame out, which that's not, doesn't validate our take. I I think the Big Ten actually had legit title contenders. I mean, how good was Illinois? How good was Michigan? The team was, the teams were loaded. Um, this year, I see. The middle is just as strong, though. I really do. It's it's this is the, the league has sort of taken a step forward from where it was maybe in the 2017, 2018, when it felt like the ACC was sort of the best conference out there. Big 12, Big 10, I think, has taken that mantle at this point. Um, and now, because you have you know elite upside at the top, and you have girth in the middle, and even teams like Penn State and Iowa and Wisconsin are going to be a little better than people think. I think they'll be solid. Um, Obviously, at the bottom end, you get Minnesota, who could be a complete and utter dumpster fire, but that's a whole other conversation. Uh, yeah, so it's down from last year, but still in the grand spectrum, last 10 years, you know, one of the top three overall leagues we've seen from this Big Ten. Well, what different, differentiates kind of the, you know, the, the consensus top four for everybody, I think, in, in whatever order you want to put them in, Michigan, Purdue, Illinois, Ohio State. I'm, I'm not as, and I talked to, maybe I talked to Bart, about this a little bit on the podcast, but Ohio State point guard play, you know, you know they brought in Jamari Wheeler. Yeah. Like I, I've watched Jamari Wheeler play point guard for Penn State, and he's never been, an, they've never been a good, really a, that great of a team with him as their point guard. Now, maybe he's coming into a better system, a better coach, better surrounding players. That's kind of the, what you hope for him. So, you know, 
what what I guess differentiates in those top four teams? Like how how do you see those um you know finishing out in terms of the standings and and how do you kind of go about ranking those four? Yeah, I, in order I have Purdue, then Michigan, then Illinois, then Ohio State, then Michigan State, then Indiana. Um, all within top twenty five or all within top twenty five, top thirty. Indiana, Michigan State fall just in, inside the top thirty for me. I have Ohio State fifteenth and Illinois tenth, and then Purdue and Michigan both top ten. Purdue in the top five. So I really only have Purdue and Michigan as like quote bona fide title contenders. Um, Ohio State, I know, is a polarizing team. You just you brought them up. I'm a little more bullish on their backcourt than than most. Um, I think Wheeler's actually a pretty good two-way player. I, I know he makes his pay on the defensive end, but I mean that team scores with their bigs. And while Dwayne Washington was an elite shot maker last year, I think Justice Suing is 75, 80% of what he brings to the table. And you got other guys who can step in there and just be a complimentary fill-in as the fifth starter. And I think EJ Liddell actually has the highest upside of any of these big 10 bigs that we're talking about, you know, Dickinson, Kofi, and Trace. I mean, every Trace, I, I hear all the improving jump shot narratives, improving right hand narratives. And I, I buy into it mostly, but I think Liddell has the highest leap to make this season. Uh, the way we started to see him shoot the ball down the stretch, he's lost it, like completely reshaped his body. I mean, he could be like a complete inside out Swiss army knife dominant force this season that you know, if you're looking at Ohio State, it's like, why are they ranked so high? I, I think you have to remind yourself, pinch yourself how good Liddell was and how good he can be uh, with the offseason transformations. So the the preseason player of the year is a, a kind of another debate. You On the top 100 that you guys did, I think you had four Big Ten players in the top seven. Um, I was looking at your rankings. I think you were a little bit higher on Trace than Hunter Dickinson, but Dylan and I from UM Hoops kind of went through the preseason uh, list that we always do that always ends up uh, a disaster uh, in retrospect. We ranked the top 25 Big Ten players. And this year it was like, all right, we're past the top four bigs. And then we're past Travion Williams, Andre Carbello, and Jaden Ivey. And then all of a sudden it's like, all right, who who else is good in this league? But those top four, uh, Kofi was preseason Big Ten player of the year. I think the Big Ten announced today where, where you know, you th- you think Liddell has the highest upside of, of those guys. But if you're, if you're kind of, placing you know a wager on who wins big 10 player of the year in the preseason who who are you who, who's the favorite tough i'm gonna go with dickinson and that's mostly a function of michigan finishing i think purdue wins the league and i think that's the of not a safe pick but i feel pretty good about that um i think michigan's nipping on their heels at two although maybe a alligator's arm length away and because of the standings projected finish there, I'm going to give a slight edge to Dickinson, along with the fact that it sounds from what I read this summer that their entire offense is going to revolve around him. Not that it didn't last year, but this year he's really going to be the hub. Um, you know, they played a little more balanced last season. So I think he's going to have a, a, a pretty good route to monster stats. Um, Liddell would be my second pick, honestly. And then I actually put Kofi third and Trace fourth as well as that sounds. I mean, this, this Team, I mean, loaded with bigs. I mean, you can't, yeah. I can't think of a season when you've had four. I mean, you take away Drew Timmy and the two stud freshmen and Paolo Boncaro and, and, uh, and Chet Holmgren, you could put those four, those four bigs along with Travion Williams and Jay Nivey, and that could be your top six players in the country. And I would have no issue with that. I and mean, that's how the talent in this league, um, the depth across the board is just very impressive. I think it's just something that, I mean, if Indiana can crack top six, that's going to be a pretty damn commendable job for Woodson's first year. Yeah, and you didn't even mention Zach Eady, who is from a, a matchup. Oh, I know. Perspective. Sorry, shame on me. The to me, he's like he's the toughest matchup in the Big Ten, right? Because you just throw him in the paint and throw him the ball. And it's like, all right, who's who's guarding? Like he 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 dwarfs Kofi. I mean, just in terms of his height. I mean, he's not bigger, but in terms of his uh, his strength and everything. But you know, he's. He can basically just turn around and, and throw the ball in the basket. It's 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 amazing, and everything we you know he played really well in the FIBA event over the summer. I think he was named like to the top five players in that event for Team Canada. Um, how how do you kind of see that duo working out with uh, with Edie and and Travion, and and where does Jaden Ivey fit in in terms of that offense? Because Purdue, you know, they like to run their offense obviously through the post, so it's. It's interesting to me, like how Painter's going to figure out when 
to give Jaden Ivey the green light or when, or are we just going to pound the ball inside? I think we ranked our, we did our top 100 player rankings just as, or right before the off season press clippings about Travion Williams and Zach E um, being deployed together is like this twin tower bully ball lineup that painter was envisioning, which is what they did not do last year. So it's a pretty seismic shift. And if that comes to fruition, then the pathway for E to play 20, 25 minutes a game is very real. And that's a terrifying proposition for the rest of the league, as you mentioned. He is a no one can guard him one on one. I mean, he's almost like Travion's personal bodyguard. He comes in, he can put pressure on Kofi and Dickinson and Trace, get those guys in foul trouble, make them uncomfortable. And whether Travion's on the floor with him or not, it just makes his life so much easier. So you have like that is your overwhelmingly, you know, how do you guard that? Just completely bends the defense with their force inside. You could nitpick that he's not specifically good at guarding pick and roll in space and on defense, but I don't know. When you have two monsters inside, I, I think you're going to be okay. Um, and then Jay and Ivy, I'm a huge fan of. I, I'm just not a, I'm not ready to crown him the nation's best player and second coming of Michael Jordan, which it sounds like a lot of the Purdue fans or just general population is. Like the whole Jay and Ivy breakout seems to be a foregone conclusion. Um, I've gotten similar vibes about um, Curbelo from Illinois. You'll just assume he's going to be IO 2.0. I think the projections for those guys is a little more rooted in, you know, projection than actually what we saw last season. You know, Ivy didn't really shoot the ball that well. Uh, you know, Curbelo hasn't really proven he can make shots, but I think I, I think both are going to be really good. But you're right. I'm, I think people need to kind of pump the brakes on declaring them um, the messiahs for their respective teams. Who do you like better, Curbelo or, or Ivy? That, I like that was an yeah, just yeah. I think on. his his size. Um, I like. I think his shot. Um, I, I'll give. I think Jared made this comparison on Assembly Call. The Oladipo from freshman to sophomore year. That's where Ivy maybe finds himself now. Where you have freak athlete. You, you see all the tools and the tantalizing, tantalizing upside with what he can do on both ends. The jump shot looks pretty good. Just hasn't made enough yet. So when he's, when Depot started making like upwards of 30, 40%, it's like, oh my God, this guy's like, now he's next level. If Ivy starts doing that this year, then that's where he'll be. So it's, I see more paths, more pathways to Ivy being great than, well, Corbello fun to watch, man. I just don't think he has Ivy's full array of, of value, just especially because on the defensive end is, is where Ivy really can, can shine this year. Shifting gears a little bit, just to talk about some teams, maybe a little bit lower down that I'm, I'm curious that I think are important for Indiana to, to keep, you know, to finish ahead of these teams if, if they want to be in a tournament team for sure. I mean, Rutgers, you mentioned a little bit, you, you said that their, their floor is, is still pretty high just based on, you know, I think Ron Harper and, and Geo Baker are really good players coming back and, and their system, they're, they're just tough to play against, but two other teams, I, I just wanted to get your take on Iowa and Wisconsin. I mean, they've been better than Indiana in, re- in recent years. Everybody's kind of picking them down below do you see any scenario where those teams are better than eighth, ninth, tenth in the Big Ten? Either one of those teams, Iowa, Wisconsin. I think they're in the same. That's sort of the tier. You know, call it tier three, where you have, in my opinion, Iowa, Wisconsin, Penn State. I'm a lot higher on Penn State than than most people, so I, I know it's maybe an unpopular opinion. And then you have Northwestern, Nebraska, Minnesota behind them. Um, no, I think there's both Iowa and Wisconsin are similar narratives, right? They are pretty, we know what we're going to get with both teams. It's going to be a seismic shift coming off of the Luca Garza explosion last year. But Iowa, even without that type of star power, always has very sublime offenses. Ball movement's fantastic. They get good shots. Defense is usually a question mark, but now McCaffrey has a more, he's infused some athletes, some size. Keegan Murray and Joe Toussaint are two actually, you know, two of the better defenders in the league, which is something Iowa doesn't usually boast on their roster. So I think the offensive defensive balance gives them a pretty safe, steady floor. They're not going to trip into bottom 10 territory, but I don't see the top five, top six upside that Indiana has with that roster. Wisconsin, same thing. It's weird. It's, we usually see a, a, the buzz cut badgers rely on upperclassmen and, you know, grizzled veterans, KG dudes who have been there, done that. And well, Brad Davison, who's on his, 13th year certainly fits that bill. It's a lot of underclassmen. And we just, again, we haven't seen that from Greg Gard, Bo Ryan. You know, usually those are system, you know, pay your, you know, invest your time, pay your dues. And then when you're a sophomore, junior, senior, that's when your time is to shine. So Wisconsin kind of has to go through that identity shift as well. 
but they're going to guard. They're going to be solid. Again, not a high ceiling, but a pretty stable floor. I don't see like a complete catastrophe from Wisconsin or Iowa. I think they'll just be solid in the mix. You go there, you're going to have to bring your A game. They could t- they could beat you, but you shouldn't have to worry about that as like a coming into Assembly Hall and, and have them on upset alert or anything. So the Big Ten had no fans last year. This year they're planning on obviously having back to normal. How big of an impact does that have on outcomes, particularly in conference play, if, if any at all? Um, I think huge. Was it 2020? We saw the Big Ten. I think it was the year I get my 19, 20, 21 seasons confused. 19, it, 20, I think it was like the highest home one court of the, winning percentage. Yeah, you, you can study. Exactly. You can study home court edge in a myriad of ways. I like to look at it from um, from an odds making perspective. You can sort of right. reverse engineer what you look at the matchups and what the spreads were closing spreads at the home and away pairings, you can kind of derive what the perceived and actual home court was. If you throw on the actual results, 2020 big 10 was like record breaking dominant. So yes, I think that because it was the last year pre fans and the fact that you're coming from a year where kids didn't play with fans, refs didn't referee in front of fans. Now that's a whole new dynamic. I think there's going to be some, some very real, like, you know, that, you know, Home court is largely rooted in referee biasing for for basketball. Um, travel is a huge part of it as well. But those, I think the fan, the shell shock nature of kids going on the road and they haven't done that in a hostile environment is going to be a little bit of a, you know, deer in the headlights, especially for the younger teams. Now, Big Ten's mostly older, experienced guys, so you could argue that's a combative force working against it. But yeah, huge. So you know, assembly hall. You know, all the big time venues in the Big Ten, those teams at the upper echelon, Michigan State should get a pretty big boost from that. You made my ears perked up when you use the word referee biasing. Give me a a a couple minute overview on what you mean by that. And, and I'm sure Indiana fans would be just, you know, they, they read my tweets all season when I talk about the Big Ten officiating and how bad it is. But uh, I'm just curious kind of what you're what what you mean by that and and am I Am I right or am I wrong when I call out the Big Ten refs? You watch as much college basketball as anybody. Is it is it consistently bad everywhere, or is this just, is this is it worse in the Big Ten? So, it, refereeing as a whole has I think gotten. I don't have any basis for this. Just feels like it's gotten worse, and I could be largely rooting that in the the stupid like technical fouls or just the dumb block charge stuff that I know is not really the referees individually fault but it's more of just a how the game is called like a more of a systemic type of thing um i, I yeah the reps are bad everywhere I'm, I'm not declared to say that they're especially biased in the big 10 over another league but you look at the historical data of both nba and college basketball there is you know some signal to the home court typically gets more favorable you know more favorable whistle right so obviously in more in bigger, louder, more boisterous venues, that's going to be amplified. And the Big Ten certainly fits that bill. Um, so when you're saying where the Big Ten reps are awful, are you saying they're biased or just outright bad and all over the place with their consistency? Well, I, what what I don't like, and and this is that, and I try to be as objective as possible, but I've seen this, you know, I've been going to Indiana games for since 2009, 2010, pretty much every home game. And what I don't like is kind of what you mentioned with the block charge call, right? You'll, you'll you'll get into a point of the game where the fans are so into the game and there's a momentum type play happening and it's you know obviously I don't have statistics to back this up but it's u- usually whatever whoever the home team is and it's a 50 50 bang bang call they're gonna get that play it's, there's nothing to, obviously for me to support that but it's just something that I feel like uh, I observe uh, time and time, you know, at Michigan State, it's probably the same thing. And and to me, it, I don't think you see that as much in the NBA, but in college basketball, it just seems like the referees can get more caught up in the the atmosphere rather than getting the call right. I mean, you know, if, if Assembly Hall is on fire and Trace Jackson Davis comes down the court and Kofi steps in front of him, gets position, but, you know, they're, they're more likely at Assembly Hall to call that a block, right? But it, right. if they're at the State, State Farm Center, it's a charge probably. So that, that's what I don't like. That's what I kind of mean. Like it, it's, it seems like the, the referees can be, and this is, this is just 
my opinion on the Big Ten can be more influenced by the atmosphere of the game rather than any than what they're actually seeing in front of them. Hey, I buy it. I do. I don't have any, like I said, I'm with the dealership. We have the data to back that up. But without it, let's just go ahead and bang the gavel and declare ourselves, you know, correct on that take. I think that's the only way to do it. It is, it's funny to note though, I'm looking at the data right now on Ken Palm and like the Big Ten's free throw rate the last few years has fluctuated. In 2020, it was one of the lowest in the country, which you would think for a league as physical as the Big Ten, there'd be more fouls. But that there's a lot of skew in that, right? Like the small conference teams that press a ton, they hack and hack and hack. So that kind of juices up their foul rates. It's tough to really make sense of that. Um, but in general, Big Ten has awesome home court and right. will likely have a maybe the highest home court, strongest home court of all the conferences this year. Um, and I think refereeing, you know, the home environment and the influence on zebras does move the needle ever so slightly, ever so slightly. So we talked a lot about Big Ten. I don't follow college basketball outside of the Big Ten nearly as closely as you do. What are two or three storylines from a national perspective that you're uh, looking at going into the season? Any teams in particular you're really looking forward, any players you're looking forward to seeing for the first time this year? Yeah, I think the freshmen coming in are, are really good. And there's a few in the Big Ten. Uh, I, you know, In my rankings, I had Paolo Boncaro for Duke and Chet Holmgren from Gonzaga. We all had them inside our top five in some order. So they're going to be awesome. There won't be, there's no Zions, but I, I said in my preview outright of Duke that Paulo is the closest thing to a Zion type of generational talent that I've seen. Um, so I think he could be really special. I think the big storyline is like Gonzaga is probably the best team on paper again. So, you know, how do they respond to that target on their back? Last year, they got all the way to the championship and then got boat raced by Baylor. Um, and then you have a lot of like the blue bloods, like Duke, Kentucky's, Kansas. Are they going to rebound North Carolina? Are they going to rebound and have their normal type of year? I think the narrator says yes. So that's where I stand on that. And then there's this swath of teams like Texas and Texas Tech and a lot of the you know power conference schools that have just hoarded all these transfers, right? And you know, everyone's older, everyone's more experienced this year. So in general, when you hear people talk about their teams or talk about prognosticating who's going to be good, it's like, well, everyone's going to be good. So you kind of have to make sure you frame everything in a relative basis, right? Like all the mid-major conferences are notorious for this. They, they think their, their team is going to win the league for the first time in 10 years because they have all five starters back. It's like, well, everyone has all five starters back. So it doesn't differentiate you at all. So that's an interesting thing. Like who, who benefits from the bonus year, the code year, and all the transfers that have come through? Um, we'll see how it plays out. But I know Bart has a, you know, Bart Torek has some great data on that, right? With the, the minutes continuity and the average experience, and how this year is going to really be a, an outlier year and the dynamics of which we'll, we'll see how it plays out. Um, I'm inclined to think a lot of like the schools in the middle of the pack are going to be boosted. There's going to be a lot more parity. Um, so the teams that are usually around, you know, average are going to be slightly above average this year, just because of that experience. Um, so we'll see. should be fun. I, I think in that light, a pretty wild NCAA tournament. I think a lot of upsets are going to happen. The, 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 the gap is going to be pretty narrow between the, the top seeds and the bottom seeds. Matt, we'll have to have you on again later in the season once we actually have some data to look at from actual Indiana games. Right now, it's all speculation. Uh, that's been the toughest thing for me, figuring out what Indiana is actually going to look like from a basketball perspective because, as you mentioned, every coach that comes in, they want to play fast. They want to they want to get up and down. They want to get guys in good position to to get good shot. You know, all the, all the stuff that we hear in all the press conferences. I think Jordan Sperber does a – good thing every year yes. where he puts all the, the yep. press conferences together. The compilation I think, clip. Yeah, I, love I don't that. think anyone's ever said, I want to, I want to uh, grind it so, out. I want to muck wanna, it up I, and slow it no, down. No one's year. ever said, I want to play like Archie Miller, right. in their, <laughs> in their, in their intro press conference, but that's what we watched the last four years, but he's at Maddie underscore Cox on Twitter. He's uh, on the three man weave. Check him out. Those guys are, you guys have some new podcast stuff coming up, right? With Field of 68. You want to talk about that for a second? Let people know where they're going to be able to find you guys. Yeah, we're going to be doing a daily show with Field of 68. Uh, Rob Douster and Jeff Goodman are the overlords there talking about gambling, betting. Dude, gambling mm -hmm. is not what we do. We bet. We bet edges. So uh, those, <laughs> one, who, those who dabble in such endeavors, please tune in. And uh, we'll, we'll be doing some stuff with the Action Network as well. So a lot of uh, betting specific content since so that's what pays the bills. And yeah. I know not, not everyone's huge fans of that, but um, in order for me to channel my college basketball obsession to a full-time occupation, that is what is required in this business. So that's what I've done. Well, 
that's that's great that you're able to do something that you love i feel lucky every day that i get to do this for a job so i'm right there with you um i enjoy your work again apologies for taking this long uh to get you on the show but we'll have to do it again soon here in a couple months i appreciate the time and uh two episodes this week of podcast on the brink now we've, we've knocked out we had bart on our early in the week and matt uh, joined us to close out the week so thanks everybody for listening and we will be back again next week it'll be just about a week away from the regular season starting with another episode of podcast on the brink. Thanks everybody for listening.